All right, our second presentation in this final module is going to cover frame relay. Now you're going to see a lot of acronyms and a lot of terms that are probably very foreign to you, and I would highly encourage you to read the book with regard to frame relay. It's something you need to understand for the CCNA, and it's something that will actually benefit you long term if you ever have to deal with frame relay in the future. So uh, lease lines are kind of expensive because they're always on and you have to have one point-to-point -point connection for each connection outbound. So several sites to a single main office and you need one lease line per site, that gets really costly really fast. Um, lead lines have a constant bandwidth, so the telco could be using it. When you're not using that bandwidth, it could be using that bandwidth for other things. So the idea here is we want to use this unused bandwidth. We want to try to take advantage of some of these things. And so Frame Relay allows a lot of different virtual circuits. So rather than having a physical switch circuit from one endpoint to another, you have what are called virtual circuits. And so you have one physical circuit that's considered an access link that goes to the telco. And then uh, the telco automatically switches them to several different virtual circuits. And so providers always give you a committed information rate. That's the minimum that you get. You always get that. You also They also allow you to burst over that rate a little bit. And then, you know, if you burst too much, then the, you'll get a nasty letter from your telco saying, hey, that you need to pay us for all of this data bandwidth that you're using. Now, consumer routers are considered the data terminal equipment, and the provider switches are considered the data communications equipment in this case. So, again, there's our demarcation point. Now some basics with frame relay, um, each virtual circuit is addressed using a data link connection identifier. This DLCI, this DLC as I like to call them, are only locally significant. In other words, what this means is your local service provider is using that DLC to determine what virtual circuit it belongs to. That number means absolutely nothing to the other end of the link, and so you can have the same DLC configured in multiple locations. Packets are encapsulated in an LAPF, and there are different uh, LAPFs that you can specify, and those are typically specified in the interface configuration. And then local link control is, link control is done with lo local management interface, uh, LMI. There are different types of LMI. These are also configured on the interfaces. Now, here's my big explanation for DLCs. These are locally significant, like I mentioned. The other side doesn't care what your DLC is. The DLC is only used by the telco to send you to the right place. When a frame relay switch receives a frame, it converts the DLC to the appropriate virtual circuit, and so it forwards the frame based on that. You can have the same DLC on both sides of a circuit. A DLC is not like an IP address and that is globally unique, but you can't use the same DLC on the same side of a connection. Again, it's locally significant, so you can have several virtual circuits on the same side. All of their DLCs have to be different, uh, but the DLCs on two different sides can have the same value. Many topologies will show DLC mappings to clarify, and many scenarios DLCs will be planned to appear as globally significant so that you don't have to think about all of this crazy DLC stuff. So with that in mind, let's look at some DLCs. You can see R1 up there in the upper left corner. We have DLC12 on one interface and DLC13 on another interface. So what this means is that when router 1 sends out traffic that's destined to router 3, it will use DLC13. When router 1 sends out router traffic that's destined to router 2, it will use DLC12. Similarly, on R2, when router 2 wants to send out traffic to router 1, it will use DLC21. When router 2 wants to send out traffic to router 3, it will use DLC23, and so on. You get the idea. So the DLC is used to specify your destination. It is not a source address. It is a destination-based address. Now, we have what's called global addressing, and this is actually very interesting because basically it makes it look like where our source address is each one. So let's say we have spoke D down there in the lower right, and spoke D wants to send data to this hub in the middle that's connected to several different uh, endpoint connections. If spoke D wants to send data up, it's going to use an address of 501. That 501 determines what it uses to send out, and it's going to look like a source address based on the DLCs that we determine. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. IP addressing for frame relay interfaces is going to be fairly simple. You can use one subnet for all frame relay devices. This is good for full mesh topologies and saves you a lot of addresses. You can also use one subnet for each virtual circuit. Um, this requires more addresses, but is actually better. And depending on your structure, you may have to use both or a combination of these. Um, so what about broadcasts? Now, frame relay doesn't actually support broadcast. It's actually basically acts like a series of point-to-point -point links. And so frame relay is typically referred to as a non-broadcast multi-access network, NBMA. You'll see this term thrown around a lot. Now, it doesn't support broadcast. It obviously doesn't support multicast either. So the problem comes about when we want to try to 
do routing protocols over a frame relay network. You can actually manually configure routers to forward broadcast over a virtual circuit. This is the only way around this, and you're going to have to do it whenever you configure a virtual circuit. So Frame Relay actually has a way to deal with internal service provider congestion, and it's done with what's called a Fecon and Beacon flag. Uh, the Fecon is a forward explicit congestion notification, and this is set by a Frame Relay router or switch once it detects congestion. In other words, if it's detecting slowness or congestion on the link, it's going to set the Fecon flag. Then, on the way back, the receiving router, after receiving the frame, will set the Beacon bit. And the frame, once it sets that back, the sending router has been notified of the congestion and can actually you know, load balance or accommodate accordingly. There's also what's called a discard eligibility bit. This is nice for stuff like voice, where you don't necessarily need the data to get there 100%. So uh, this is, if you're sending data over your committed information rate, or like I said, you're sending voice, or you're bursting, or something like that, and you're okay with the service provider discarding the data if it needs to be discarded, you can set the discard el eligibility. Now, because DELCs and IP addresses aren't necessarily associated, free relay routers have to perform what's called inverse ARP. Inverse ARP is basically when a virtual circuit comes up, nobody knows where IP addresses are, nobody knows what DELCs are, and so routers will actually, rather than just try to ARP for it, because broadcasts aren't supported, you'll remember, they can't do a broadcast. So what routers will do is they will just advertise their IP addresses directly as soon as the DELC is associated. IP addresses can also be statically mapped on each side, and in that case you don't need to worry about inverse so some configuration for you. For a single interface, you can configure encapsulation frame relay and specify the type. You can configure the LMI type. You can also configure the mapping of the IP address to a DELCI. For sub-interfaces, this is nice if you have multiple virtual circuits on a single physical circuit. You can configure a sub-interface with the frame relay, relay interface DELCI and the mapping directly. For diagnostics, uh, we have show interfaces, which is very nice for frame relay. We have show frame relay. Actually, there are several show frame relay commands that you should be familiar with. And then debug frame relay, which is useful for debugging topologies as they come up. That just about wraps it up for frame relay. Again, there is more to frame relay than I would like to present and that I have time to present, so I'd encourage you to go through the books, try to break down frame relay into its smaller parts, and if you have questions, let me know. I spent a lot of time reviewing frame relay because I haven't had much of a chance to mess around with it directly. I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of frame relay, but I want to make sure you guys do too. So again, if you have questions or comments, put them in the section below, and uh, I'll see you in the last presentation.